Ian, fantastic to see you again on Real Vision. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Yes, first time you and I have chatted on screen, and I'm really looking forward to this. If for anybody who didn't watch the last interview, can you give a bit of your ludicrous background? Because it's a, it's a great background, and I think it's it's super interesting. I'll give you the Reader's Digest version, and then you can ask any any details that, that you want. Because there are portions of it that are like a year long that could be a book. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm from Indiana. Uh, I had a kid when I was 17. But I had started doing computers when I was really young. I had a stepdad that was into computers. So we had Apple IIs in the house. But then when he and my mom divorced, then there were no computers in the house. So I just had skateboarding and punk rock. And I think that those two like foundations have kind of carried me all the way through. And actually, like being a dad young was a pretty important part of, of, of my life as well. But when I got to college, it was 1990, and I started studying computer science. I started working at the music library, and there was this visionary guy who had this idea that you could take all of the res reserve listening materials. So instead of coming in at 6 p.m. and someone puts a needle on a record, then you sit there with headphones. He had this vision, and this is the early 90s, remember. But he had this vision. I mean, there, I think there were fewer than there were somewhere on the order of 50 million personal computers on planet Earth at the time. But he had this vision that it was going to be workstations throughout the library. And you would search the card catalog and you'd be able to stream, uh, you know, a piece of music to it. Now, I mean, it's hard to describe because now you can just open your phone and you hit music and you hit play and it comes. But at the time, you know, IBM had a special file system for streaming because just getting the audio data off of disk quickly enough was a challenge technically, right? So, but this is what we built. And, and we built, you know, really the first search and stream system for academia back in, back in those days. And, you know, you would search the campus card catalog and then First, the computer was under my desk. It was an IBM R6000, and I had a Next on top of my desk. And then we just kind of moved the computer further and further away. And then that was my my career until, you know, it was Apple Music, you know, because I went from that to I actually dropped out of grad school in 1995 to go on tour with the Beastie Boys. Um, and I, I ran, you know, I, I worked with a, a number of, of artists and, and you know, I, I moved to L.A. and the only people I knew were the Beastie Boys. But if you were in L.A. in 1995, whether you were Whoopi Goldberg, Pee Wee Herman or Barry Gordy, I'm probably the one that you called to say, what is this Internet thing? Um, and then I, we had a I joined a, a company in, in the late 90s called Nullsoft. Actually, if I can angle my camera, you can see my Winamp NFT up there. Oh, yeah, uh, we made it. We made an MP3 player uh, called Winamp. Um, and I ran winamp.com and, and, and that was a great Cinderella story in the, in the dot-com bubble, you know, four, four, four employees, no debt, no equity, um, exit to AOL for a hundred, a hundred million in, in May of 1999, but a hundred million in AOL stock, you know, so that, that's another, uh, that's another, not, that's another, not quite story. perfect. Yeah. Another story. So I, I've, uh, I know the, the dot-com bubble well, and I see a lot of, there's a lot of pattern matching to be done in the world of crypto, <laughs> right? Then went from. Nullsoft, two of us left Nullsoft and, and built kind of a web-based version of Winamp, more or less, that we sold to Dave Goldberg and Yahoo in uh, December of 2003. We built Yahoo's music subscri subscription service, which was called Yahoo Music Unlimited. Um, I'm not offended if you haven't heard of it, but it was a $5 a month, all-you-can-eat subscription service. You know, so very much like Spotify, but doing something like that before the iPhone was right idea too early. Um, so uh, also a lot of pattern matching there. And, you know, we had the power of, of Yahoo and even some mobile carriers like Rogers in Canada behind us. So, and, you know, an interesting story. And we were we were even doing connected hardware, um, you know, so that the first kind of, uh, you know, Internet connected MP3 player uh, we worked on as part of that project as well. Um, but again, you know, it's one of those lessons of, you know, right, right idea too early. Um, then I uh, had a company called Topspin where we did direct to consumer marketing and commerce for, um, you know, for mostly for bands. Think Bandcamp. If you're familiar with Bandcamp, yeah. it's uh, it's very similar to that. That ultimately, you know, was not a successful company. We raised, you know, more in venture than we sold the company for. Ultimately, I joined Jimmy Iovine, Dr. Dre, Trent Reznor, Luke Wood, Omar Johnson and others um, to build to spin a software company out of Beats Electronics, a headphones company. Uh, called Beats Music, um, capitalized with, um, you know, with with people like Mark Rowan and Len Blavatnik. Um, and then we, we built that, launched it with a Super Bowl commercial, AT&T, the works. Um, and then Jimmy very quickly uh, found a way to sell us to Apple, which was fantastic. 
with their I mean, did you ever and... imagine a skate punk from Indiana would end up building beat, selling it to Apple? I mean, you must have at some point thought this is ludicrous. I thought it was ludicrous from day one. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I was. You You've know, had I, imposter I syndrome all the way through, I take it. All the way through. I love that quote. You know, we can't all have imposter sy syndrome. Some of us must be genuinely bad at our jobs. <laughs> um, the, the um, you know, but, but man, I mean, I, 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 I'm thankful every morning I wake up and I, you know, and I, and somebody still gives a shit what I have to say, because, you know, I, I, again, I had a kid when I was 17 in Goshen, Indiana, I'm supposed to be, you know, living in a trailer park and, and, you know, w working in a gas station. Um, you know, but really, I, I, I actually think it's an interesting part of the, of the story. Like, if you think about it, I think there's a lot of what's going on in America that I'm the poster child for, right? My mom worked in a factory, my stepmom, my grandma, uh, my uncle all worked in the same factory. My dad was a fireman, the first person in my family to go to college. I only went to college because I was, you know, having a kid and thankfully I knocked up the valedictorian. So she kind of like had a path <laughs> to go there. My mom, you know, to credit where it's due, my mom had actually gone back to college in her late thirties, I guess, and spent five years getting a two year nursing degree. And so I had in my head like, wow, well, if she can do it, I can probably do it. Right. And, um, you know, but also I then moved to California. I mean, I moved there because of the beastie boys, but if you think about it, you know, why do you move from a red state to a blue state? Because that's where the jobs are. You know, it depends on, on, on what you do. Right. So I, I I'm, I'm really technology, um, what set me free. Technology was social mobility for me, um, you know, and I, I think I think also, though, just having that, you know, I'm a record collector since I was five years old. So, you know, ha having that kind of closeness to culture. But there's another piece of it. You mentioned skateboarding. Um, and I think that for me, skateboarding and punk rock really informs so much of what I do, because I think if you grew up outside of mainstream culture, then the Internet felt really comfortable to you. I think if you grew up like if, if I was like in if I if I what I did was broadcast television, the Internet would have probably turned my world upside down. Right. Um, but since I came from a world where you ordered vinyl from the back of Maximum Rock and Roll magazine and the way you communicated was you took a piece of white paper and a Sharpie and then went to a photocopy machine and then handed out copies of your zine to all your friends. You know, when I saw the Internet, just like the Beastie Boys, I showed the Beastie Boys the Internet for the first time in the summer of 1994, and they immediately had a thousand ideas because like me, they'd grown up with punk rock and skateboarding. So they went, oh, we get it. This is like, you know, and even them having been a band that had MTV success, they knew that that MTC, MTV success wasn't there tomorrow and having a direct channel to their fans would, would, was going to be helpful to them. And for, especially for all the weird stuff they wanted to do that MTV didn't, and radio didn't want to hear from them on. They're like, oh, God, a way we can get around these guys. So I, I, think that, um, I think that there's two things there. One is just, look, if you can code, you can work. And I can code. Right. The second is, is that culture has changed. And I think that what I've discovered having gone and I, I didn't get to the very end where after I, we launched Apple Music, I got a call from a, a recruiter about um, a company called LVMH, which I had never heard of at the time. How, how um, did you not you heard know, of LVMH at the time? I am a skateboarder. From I guess Indiana. you're a skate like, punk. I, yeah, I get it. It's not, you know, I, I I'd heard of the brands. I was like, when they told me, they're like, oh, you know, it's the it's the company that owns, you know, Louis Vuitton and Dior, and I, you know, I didn't know there was one French family that that owned like Celine and and Sephora. Like that's just you know one step further than I was like you know than I was aware. It's just not my world, um, you know. But but I think that that culturally there was uh, there was a lot that made sense to me. You know, so yesterday evening, I, I, I got the news of, of, you know, Virgil Abloh passing away. But Virgil Abloh is a skateboarder from Rockford, Illinois. So if you think about where I come from, culturally, very similar. And he grew up a fan of the Beastie Boys, just like me, you know. So culturally, th there's huge crossover in these worlds. You know, I'm bidding right now on these Givenchy NFTs that were <laughs> painted by Cheeto, who's a street artist, worked with Supreme. You know, the Givenchy collection is with Matt Williams, who's a skateboarder from Pismo Beach, California, right? So there's a lot of crossover in, you know, culturally. And I don't think that's accidental. I, I think that, you know, there, there are those of us who grew up outside of mainstream culture just feel more comfortable in the culture of today. You know, it makes sense to us. And it also, look, you know, when I look at your career, it's there's that narrative arc of, you said, outsiders and culture. And you've just happened, well, not just happened, 
you found yourself at the forefront of all of that. And by the time you turn up at LVMH, they're pivoting away from it being just around, you know, rich people with handbags and being around what is the cultural significance of what they do. And I think, so you turn up to a brand like that, what the hell do you do? You again must be thinking, well, here I am sitting to talking to Bernard Arnault. What am I going to offer him? Well, you know, and that, that was the weird thing because I, I came in as the chief digital officer, which is kind of a nebulous title. Scott Galloway said to me when I, when I first met him, he said, uh, chief digital officer, is that kind of like chief electricity officer? <laughs> um, and yeah, you're, you're right. Um, but I mean, it is funny. Culturally, I went from, you know, talking on the phone with, you know, with Kanye at Apple to talking on the phone with Kanye at LVMH in the space of like a month. And so that was like, well, this feels familiar. That's culturally, though, I, I think actually, you know, when I think of what I'm really proud of, what we did at LVMH, it's it's actually more about this, the, and it comes to crypto, it's more about this digitization of everything. Because yeah. there's another vector here that's really interesting in that I got to see music go from 0% digitized to 99% digitized. And so when I looked at LVMH, I said, huh, okay, what I really am is a student of how is technology changing culture? And one thing that we can say overall is that we're moving from mass to niche, right? We're moving from kind of, you know, nations to tribes. That's another another conversation I think you and I had last time. And, you know, there's, and, and so that, when you look at LVMH, I'm, I also, you know, say we're going from, from where a world where marketing is hyper-efficient to a world where quality is hyper-efficient, you know, because word of mouth is so strong and consumer choice is so high. But I think that's where luxury really wins. Because here you have a mass of very valuable niches who are focused on quality. And they're focused on quality and communications, quality of product. They're unapologetic about price. They say, we make the best product. We make it in France. We design it with you know, a lot of care. We spend a lot of money on marketing. We make good content and it costs this. And if you don't want it, don't buy it. And I would argue that is what works. So when I looked at LVMH and I said, well, here's a business that's 3% digitized that's going to become a lot more, right? So I think with e-commerce, that number is 35 to 50%, right? And now you start throwing digital goods on top of that and, and who knows? Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to like and subscribe for more crypto related content. Also be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com slash crypto.